This Saturday's Michigan-Ohio State game will be like no other, and there are going to be a ton of eyes on this game, and some of the most important people in attendance are the recruits. We're going to break down Michigan-Ohio State from a recruiting perspective. Will Bryce Underwood be at the game? Find out if Michigan's recruiting class can hold up with all the drama surrounding the program right now. But first, Michigan fans, hit subscribe to the On3 Recruits channel. We're trying to grow this thing almost 25K. We need you to be a part of it. Hit subscribe for me, please. All right, let's bring on Zach Libby from the Wolverine. And Zach, before we get into some of these big names on campus this weekend, last week, Michigan fired linebackers coach Chris Partridge, and it was rather abrupt. What was the recruiting reaction to that, both from targets and commitments? Yeah, abrupt's a good way to put it. Um, I think the reactions of commits who had a really good relationship with Partridge and, you know, commitment, their commitments was a big reason because of their relationship with him. Um, it, I think their reactions were abrupt too. And same goes for the targets. Um, you know, we, we quickly spoken to people who are close to those commitments. We even gotten reactions from the uh, commits themselves, but I think no one's doing anything abrupt in terms of actions. Like right. no one has decommitted yet. No one has taken visits elsewhere. Um, you know, other coaches were deeply involved in their recruitments just as much as Partridge was. So, you know, communication hasn't stopped. Obviously, those other coaches quickly got on the phone and communicated with um, those commits in question. So, I mean, I think the, the feeling is that, you know, you just got want to see what happens next, um, specifically with who they're going to hire. Um, I actually spoken to one of the commits on Saturday, Jeremiah Beasley, four star out of Belleville who said, I guess the plan that the coaches told him was that they're going to bring in someone who's going to connect out well with all the future linebackers. And that's what they want, right? Like someone mm -hmm. who can uh, give them that development on and off the field. Um, but with Partridge, obviously he did a really good job um, in, you know, his second stint with the Wolverines. When you're concerning targets, you know, top 100 guys like Noah McHale out of California or um, top 100 linebacker from uh, – uh, Central Florida, Elijah Melendez, who's visiting for the Ohio State game. Like, there's a really key crop of linebackers next cycle, and it's a very deep position, a deep position for 25. So, whoever it is, you know, obviously they got to mend those relationships from before, find his own targets that he likes, and then obviously keep the commits that um, Partridge was responsible for in the 2024 recruiting class. So, right now, um, we'll see what happens. All right, let's uh, let's fast forward to the weekend. Big names at the big house. Here we go. Some huge 2025 prospects on campus. Offensive lineman David Sanders out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Safety DJ Pickett out of Zephyr Hills, Florida. Trey McNutt out of the Cleveland area. All top 100 prospects or higher. And uh, they're going to be at the big house on Saturday. So let's start with David Sanders, the big offensive tackle from Charlotte, North Carolina. Not his first time on campus. Michigan's doing pretty well in this recruitment, huh? Yep, uh, for the number three overall offensive tackle, yeah. uh, number three overall prospect in the country, number one offensive tackle, um, just a freak athlete, one of the premier um, positional players for next cycle at, at on that line. Um, Michigan brought him in for the first time in late July for the annual barbecue at the Big House. Um, Michigan was actually the first school to ever offer Sanders um, with offensive line coach Cheryl Moore, building a strong relationship with uh, him and his family. Um, obviously, Michigan has had a ton of success at the offensive line position, you know, with back to back Joe Moore awards, something that's deeply impressed Sanders. Um, there's a lot of connections too uh, with the Michigan program for Sanders, who hails from Charlotte Providence Day, um, one of the powerhouses down there. But Michigan has already has two commits um, in Sanders' teammates and uh, four star quarterback Jane Davis and then wide receiver mm -hmm. Annie Goodwin. In fact, too, Michigan's uh, a former Michigan offensive lineman, Jonathan Goodwin, who's the father of Channing, um, is the offensive line coach at Providence Day. So um, there's a lot that, you know, the, that can be sold on the field and just, you know, connections wise for Michigan. Obviously, Bama, Georgia, Clemson are just heavily, heavily in the mix as well. Um, you know, for a kid of his stature and a kid of his um, talent, obviously he's going to command a lot of NIL. So that's going to, uh, we'll see how big of a factor that be that becomes. But having him come back twice in a year is huge, and we'll see if Michigan can land um, this marquee athlete. 
Absolutely. There's some big ties there to one of the top offensive linemen in the country. And then also, let's take a look at DJ Pickett. He's a five-star out of Zephyr Hills, Florida. And there's some connections there too, Zach. Yeah, so this is a kid whose mother actually attended Michigan. And he has family connections in throughout Southeast Michigan. Um, this upcoming weekend will be his fourth total visit to Michigan. Oh, wow. um, he was there over the summer. Um, where he got to be with the coaching staff, you know, Jim Harbaugh, defensive ass coach Steve Klingscale. But he has taken in that game day experience before. He was there last year for the Penn State game. Um, he was planned to be there actually on campus earlier in September for the Rutgers game, but change of plans. So now he's going to go see the game against the Buckeyes. But yeah, as mentioned before with Steve Klingscale, he's leading the way. Um, he's making a really big impression on the, the entire family. Pickett has a really good relationship, too, and, you know, really close friendship with 2025 on 300 cornerback commit Chris Ewald, who committed to Michigan this past December. And I know they've talked about potentially playing together, but, you know, all those reasons combined, there's um, there's an argument that Michigan is obviously in the top schools for him with Georgia, Oregon, all the Florida schools. So, like with Sanders, you know, he's going to command NIL, but he hasn't really mentioned that it's going to be a big factor. But mm -hmm. um, with a summer decision coming up, you know, Michigan can play the long game with him and uh, bring him in a couple more times to finalize, you know, coming up on top. All right. Now we move on to Trey McNutt. Now he has ties except they're to the Ohio State program. So why is Michigan bringing him in? Or do they have a kind of a foot in the door with McNutt? Yeah, so obviously Michigan has made a big effort um, these past few cycles to recruit the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, in 2023 and 2024 combined, eight commits from Ohio who are native to Ohio have committed to Michigan. And that includes top 100 running back Jordan Marshall, who Ohio State was pushing for as well. Um, but 2025 is shaping up to be another classic Michigan-Ohio State battle on the trail, um, with Trey McNutt being one of those featured players. Um he took this will be his uh, second visit to Michigan. He did take one in late May uh, where he got to be with Steve Cleansale, who is native to Youngstown. Now, Youngstown is not too far from Cleveland, but that connection is uh, doing wonders. And not only that, Cleansale has known Trey's McNutt's family for years. Um, now, McNutt's father is a longtime defensive best coach at the collegiate level, um, played college football himself. So they've known they've. You know, Clingsdale is considered to be family of sorts, you know, after speaking with McNutt earlier this fall. But, you know, like you mentioned, a lot of really deep Ohio State ties. Um, McNutt's father played on the 2002 national championship team. So did his uncle. But what's really interesting about this recruitment is that he has said that he want, you know, he's kind of enjoyed seeing his own path. You know, he, all he's, he's known his entire life about the Buckeyes, but, you know, going to different schools like Tennessee and Notre Dame and Michigan have kind of opened his eyes of what's available, you know, outside of Columbus. So we'll see how open he is. Um, <laughs> you know, it's going to be a tough battle to beat out Ohio state. Obviously they have the huge advantage, but um, it's going to be an interesting one heading into the off season. Yeah. But Hey, you invited him to the game. So go out, beat Ohio state on your home field and his recruitment maybe becomes a lot easier you never know. Uh, one name that I didn't see on our list of 2025 recruits in the big house was the number one quarterback, number one overall in the class, Bryce Underwood. Will he be on campus on Saturday? It's not confirmed or set that he is set to be on campus. However, Michigan is working to get him, for a game day visit, which would be the first time this season that he's done so. Right. And it would be the, a return from his late July back to back visits. Right. Um, but yeah, Michigan has yet to bring him in um, with this fall with about 50 days left until uh, he's announced his commitment on January hmm. 6. But, you know, obviously we know that Michigan just landed a quarterback commitment from Carter Smith out of Fort Myers, ranked in the on 300. But Michigan has yet to wave the light flag on Bryce Underwood. LSU is getting a ton of momentum these past couple of weeks for the number one overall player in the 2025 recruiting class. But being that he lives 30 minutes away and quarterbacks coach Kirk Campbell has done an excellent job of building a rapport with not only the six foot three, 215 pounder, but his entire family. Um, the goal would be to get him in for that game. Um, if worst case scenario, you know, you work towards getting him in for a December visit before that uh, dead period begins on the 18th of December. 
All right. Well, as if all eyes weren't already on the sidelines in Ann Arbor this weekend, they're going to be checking to see if Bryce Underwood shows up. Huge list of visits. You can guys go check out the Wolverine.com. They have all the visits lined up. It's pretty insane. Zach Libby, thanks for stopping by the Inside Scoop today. Appreciate it, Josh. Thanks. Despite having a rough season on the field, the Gators, they still got a top five recruiting class. And this weekend with their rival, the undefeated Florida State Seminoles coming to town, UF, they're looking to play spoiler and end the season on a high note. In this video, we're going to hit on a few key flip targets that are going to be in Gainesville. Will five-star Jordan Seaton make an appearance? And what UF needs to do to keep this class together down the stretch. All right, Gator fans, hit that subscribe button to the On3 Recruits channel. We're growing this page. We need you to be a part of it. So hit subscribe, please. All right, let's bring on Corey Bender from Gators Online. And uh, the two major flip targets on campus this weekend, five-star wide receiver Jeremiah Smith committed to Ohio State. We talk about him all the time, but I kind of want to focus on defensive lineman Dalen Evans. Now, he's committed to Texas A&M, and it felt like Evans was on the verge of flipping a UF really uh, at a few times throughout the summer, and then things just kind of quieted down on that front. But he's back in Gainesville this weekend, so what are you hearing on UF uh, chances to flip him? Yeah, Josh, I actually spoke with Dalen late last night. He sent me a message around 12 o'clock last night saying that's the plan still to go to Gainesville. We had him as a maybe before. Mm -hmm. That's because last Thursday he got surgery, so he didn't know if he could travel, his mobility uh, and all that. But as of last night, which is huge news for Florida, he is playing to be in Gainesville. And I think Florida definitely has a real good shot. I think the X factor is who A&M hires as a head coach. He's obviously a Texas kid. He's loved the program for most of his life. But Florida has always been viewed as a number two school, like you said. Um, he's been, been there in the spring. He went for an OV. And I think Florida, in order to flip him, they have to get him on campus one more time. Even if they didn't, I know they're going to do a series of in-home business with them. That will definitely make an impact. But I think for Florida, the main factor is kind of refreshing his mind on why Florida was always a threat you know, earlier in the year and getting him yeah. back on campus. And as of today, he's heading back this weekend. Yeah, and, you know, the Gators season kind of fell off, but so did Texas A&M's. And with the firing yeah. of Jimbo Fisher, there's a lot of teams that are looking at this Texas A&M commitment list. So does the gate do the Gators have any other competition for Dalen Evans? Yeah, there's schools like TCU. They got an OV over the week, uh, over the summer, too. Obviously, proximity favors them a little bit. Alabama's knocking on the door. Mm -hmm. I think a lot more schools will kind of emerge knowing that, hey, this is a blue chip defensive lineman. Can't have enough of these kids. And obviously, I think schools will have maybe a few slots left open. And then the class that kind of maybe maybe they didn't work plan taking another D lineman, but with a talent like this, you know, they could be, you know, pursuing him a little bit more. So I think Florida right now, they definitely have competition. I've heard about five to six schools linked to his name. But I think right now, I think AM, they're still holding on. I think it'll determine on the head coaching hire. And I think Florida, you have to put them at that number two spot. All right. Well, I can't wait to hear more about it after the weekend, because like you said, Dalen Evans needs to get back into town before we kind of know what he's going to do next. Uh, somebody that else is that's coming into town I want to talk about. He's not committed anywhere, and that's Zay Mincy. Number 61 overall, he goes 6'2 and a half, 175 pounds, and he's from Daytona Beach, Mainland. Now, Gator fans know that school because LJ McRae, the number one defensive lineman, is committed to the Gators, and he's also from Mainland High School. So uh, I wanted to ask you, after that Miami game that Mincy attended like two months ago, he said he was ready to silently commit somewhere. He said he was going to do it, actually. And, you know, he would let the whole world know in January. Do you think that he actually silently committed somewhere? I don't. And we, we asked him about a month ago, and he didn't really want to comment, in, comment on it. And if he did, I think there's so much shakeup right now with the four right. schools. It's been Alabama, Florida, Miami, and Florida State. Miami and Florida have been the schools mentioned the most for probably most of this year. But I think right now his recruitment's pretty fluid. You know, Alabama got an OV a few weeks ago. That really opened the door for them to kind of make him more of a realistic option for him. His brother, I believe it's Alabama State, um, played mm -hmm. for the football team. So then there's a little connection there if he wanted to go, you know, live in Alabama when it was attending their school. So I think Florida State's the one school that could be the dark horse here. You know, obviously everything's clicking on all cylinders on the field. They were viewed as the fourth option for much of this year. But I think with the way they're winning on the field, you know, obviously LJ and him both got on campus um, a few weeks ago or last mm -hmm. week. And I, I think that visit could really kind of open the door and make them more of a realistic option. So I'm still giving Florida the very slight edge. And obviously having LJ in the class helps with that. And they'll both be on campus this weekend. So 
This recruitment fluid, Josh, I, I could see it going a few different ways. And I think this visit in Gainesville this weekend will have a big impact on kind of where his head, where his heart's kind of leaning down the stretch. Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with you. I think Florida maybe heading into this weekend is the team to beat, but I think Alabama running right there in second and then FSU kind of the dark horse. I, I fully agree with that right now. Uh, I yeah. think maybe, you know, the results on the field, UF gets a big win this weekend. Hey, it could push it in, in the Gators' favor. But if Florida State can go into the swamp in front of Zay Mincy and win another game, you know, maybe they keep moving up in his list, but we'll see after that. Uh, we got to talk about five-star offensive tackle Jordan Seaton because he named a top seven. The Gators were in it, and he went to Knoxville over the weekend, and he came out of that visit saying, hey, this might be it for me. I might, I might just wrap it up. Um, but I get the feeling that if the Gators are going to really have a shot at Seaton, they need to get him back on campus. Do you agree with that? Yeah. 100%. Yeah. And I think also, too, they have to get a, they have to really do well in the in-home visit process, too. I don't think it's really anything Florida's doing. I know, obviously, the wins and loss matter. But as far as relationship wise, I don't think it's anything Florida's doing wrong. I just think overall, when he looks at this, I know NIL is a big thing. I think a lot of these schools, you don't often see true freshman O tackles start early on. But I think he's one of those guys. He could probably step in at several schools oh, yeah. here and play. So I think Florida, they need a lot of help at all lines. So that helps. But I think overall, I think Florida, they're, they're fading a little bit here. I know obviously communication is taking place. It is one of those games, Florida, Florida State night game, where you have a few surprises and guys show up. From what I've talked to a few sources, he hasn't been on the list as far as expected guy, but he could be one of those late additions, as he always says, just kind of stay yeah. tuned and see where I head, you know, head this weekend. So right now I don't expect him in Gainesville, but if he did, that would be a massive deal for Florida. But either way, if he goes or he doesn't uh, end up on campus, Florida definitely has some good ground to make up right now. Yeah, because right now his plan is to be at IMG Academy down in Bradenton for the weekend and not go anywhere. So I'm not, you know, I know yeah. those are his plans, but Gainesville is only two and a half, three hours away. So there's always that chance. And I do agree with you. I think that I think that this, the Gators are, are there. They're in the picture. But Oregon, Ohio State, you know, there's just Tennessee. I think UF needs a, maybe a refresher in his mind and get him back on yep. campus down the stretch to have a real shot. And we'll see what happens here. He's not that far away, but that's somebody I would keep an eye on if I'm Gator fans. Um, now, I want to talk about well, one we, other player. Also, too, I'll yeah. mention, too, Josh, too, Jerry Hawkins was on our visitors list, and obviously that would have helped if he would have stayed in Brainton. Maybe he links on. But as of yesterday, we took him off the visitors list. He's back in West Virginia for break, so – Maybe that puts a twist into the plans too. But yeah, like you said, we'll, we'll kind of keep it, keep our eyes on it. All right. Now, how important do you think a win is? Because we've kind of, when we're talking about the UF team and the UF commit list throughout this cycle, we've said that, hey, you know, they've communicated with these recruits about the way that the season's going to go. They know what to expect. We expect for to, to weather this storm. Well, now the games are getting played. Florida isn't bowl eligible. Does this game matter when it comes to recruiting? What the results on the field, do they matter this weekend? Rivalry season is here and you better have your tickets. There's still some great games left in the season, but you know what's not great? Finding last minute tickets. Finding tickets before a game can be a nightmare. Do not let this be the way that your season ends. That's why I'm here to tell you about game time. It's the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the big time matchups. Game Time will get you to this year's biggest college football games with elite deals on last-minute tickets and the best price guarantee. Don't stress over getting into your favorite team's biggest rivalry game of the year. There's only so many big games, and you need to get these tickets at the best prices. Game Time is the place for last-minute ticket deals. Forget planning months in advance. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Game Time has tickets right up to the start of the event and even an hour after it starts. It is the place to find last minute tickets. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets on all sports and even concert events. So here's what we're gonna do. Snag the tickets without stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account and use code inside scoop to get $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply, again, create an account and use code inside scoop for $20 off. Download game time today, last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. I think so for sure. I, I think everyone knows obviously both teams will be up without their starting quarterbacks. I think Florida has a real shot of winning this game. I really mm -hmm. do. Just the fact is that's a swamp. I feel like the Tennessee game comes to mind too. 
Florida has a lot of talent. It's just they have they make a lot of crucial mistakes, in my opinion, especially on defense. I think offense, they should be fine. But as, as far as recruiting, yeah, I think it definitely – the Swamp's going to be obviously electric no matter what. It's the last game of the season, the night game in the Swamp against your rival. I think a big win, obviously, versus a top-ranked team, even though everyone knows, hey, the uh, FSU's without their starting quarterback, it's still something kind of get excited about and get everyone back on Billy Napier's side. Right. I know um, – I wouldn't say the, the the seat's getting hot for him, but with the fan base it is. You know, a lot of people – you know, Florida, a lot of these Florida schools, they're eager for results right away. So I think either way, it, it gives them kind of something to kind of build off going into the evaluation period. And, you know, us as adults compared to kids, we all look at stuff differently. A lot of these kids I've talked to, they – you know, they say like, hey, I look at my position group only on the field and see the opportunities. So mm-hmm. everyone looks at different things, but I think Florida needs this win just from a momentum standpoint yeah. going into recruiting season. Yeah, I agree. I think throughout the summer, there was no hotter team on the recruiting trail than the Florida Gators. Then it kind of plateaued during the season. That's no surprise. When they're losing games, it's hard to add recruits. Now, going winless in November would hurt recruiting, I think, but winning that final game, it gives you momentum. It gives you that win in November. It gives you a win over your rival like you said and maybe they can take that momentum in and add to their commit list rather than just playing defense down the stretch so we'll see how it all shakes out big game this weekend for four to four to state it's on friday Corey, we'll bring you back on the inside scoop to talk all about this big visit weekend on monday thanks for having me on josh just over a week ago LSU lost a commitment when four-star corner Kai Bates announced his decommitment and that he was reopening his recruitment. And now it seems like Bates is on the verge of making a second and final decision. So he chose LSU over Tennessee originally, but since then, Florida State has entered the picture. So in this video, I'm going to bring on Director of Recruiting Chad Simmons to go behind the scenes of Kai Bates' recruitment. But first, FSU and Tennessee fans, Hit the subscribe button to the On3 Recruits channel. We're growing this thing. we got a lot of recruiting to talk about between now and signing day. So hit subscribe for me, please. Okay, let's bring on Director of Recruiting, Chad Simmons. Now, Chad, when Kai Bates committed to LSU, it was mainly an LSU-Tennessee battle. So now that he's back on the market, this should be a slam dunk for Tennessee, right? You know, there, there's never a slam dunk. It's not that easy, I would say, in recruiting, never. Josh. Yes, I think, you know, Tennessee's definitely been a factor consistently, even when he did commit to LSU over the summer. Um, he was very close to committing to Tennessee when he made that decision the yeah. first time around. So we know communication is strong. He feels good about that culture and those relationships. But like you mentioned, FSU has surged you know, in recent weeks, got him on campus, and Uh, It's a battle, I think, right now, pretty tight at the top between Florida State and Tennessee. All right, so what visits has Bates taken so far this season, and did he end up visiting Knoxville last weekend? Because I know he was tentatively on that visitor list. Yeah, he did not make Mm -hmm. that trip to Tennessee. Tennessee was working to get him back on campus after he went to Tallahassee for the Miami game, so he was there. Week before that, he was in Knoxville for the UConn game, kind of quietly under the radar uh, when he was still committed to LSU at the time. Uh, he got to Knoxville, spent some time on campus there with the staff. He's been to A&M as well. They're kind of out of the race, though. Obviously, a coaching change there. Uh, he was there early in the fall. But the meaningful visits he's taken was Florida State for the Miami game, Tennessee for the UConn game. Uh, and both those schools, again, are duking it out right now at the top. All right, so we know that the early signing period is December 20, but it's starting to feel like Kai Bates could decide sooner. What are you hearing on a decision date? Yeah, I don't think he takes it to the 20th, Josh. I mean, I think there's a chance he commits, you know, end of November. I'm here one to two weeks, somewhere in that time, mm-hmm. time frame again. You know, he may, he'll take the time that he needs to figure things out. I don't think it happens, you know, this week, Thanksgiving week, nothing like right. that. But I do think, you know, he's fairly close. But at the same time, I'm being told by a source that he's torn. You know, he's gone. I think when he... Before he visited that FSU game for Miami, I think he was leaning pretty heavily towards Tennessee. When he took that trip uh, to Tallahassee, you know, things changed. Uh, Florida State made a big push that weekend and has kind of remained, I think, their confidence probably growing a little bit steadily throughout that the last week or two um, with Kai Bates. So I think, you know, this one has gone back and forth over the last couple of weeks between Tennessee and Florida State. I don't think he's quite ready to make that decision or make that call yet. 
Uh, but the confidence probably is a little bit more, uh, I guess, stronger in Tallahassee than Knoxville today. Mm. So as it stands now, do you expect him to take any other trips before a decision comes? Yeah, I'd lean towards no. I think he's seen what he needs to see. I mean, could that happen? Yes. I think there's some people obviously in his circle. Uh, what I'm hearing are pro Florida State. It's an in-state school, a little easier to get to from Orlando than it is to Knoxville. So could he show up back at Florida State at some point in December? That's possible. You know, Tennessee as well, that's a possibility. But right now, uh, I would lean towards he will not take any more visits before he makes that decision. Mm. So I know a lot can happen in a week or two in recruiting. So, but which way are you leaning right now with Bates? You know, based on what I'm hearing, I would lead slightly towards Florida State. Again, they took, they had the last visit uh, and then decommitted a couple of days later uh, after he was in Tallahassee from LSU. Uh, but he was at Tennessee, you know, not long before that. So I think, uh, you know, FSU based on Intel, uh, the buzz is around the in-state program. There's been some moving parts there. Uh, DB, CJ Hurd mm -hmm. decommitted uh, over the weekend. So there's some moving parts about how they want to finalize and finish out that DB class here in 2024. Um, but again, he has some big calls, I'm told, this week to both Tennessee and Florida State. Maybe has a few questions to ask both staffs. But right now, as we shoot this, Josh, I lean slightly towards Florida State. All right. Well, what do you guys think? Let me know. Comment section below. Do you guys think he's going to go to Tennessee or Florida State? Let me know. All right, Chad. Thanks for dropping by today on the Inside Scoop. Thank you. Four-star cornerback Kobe Black is one of the top uncommitted recruits in the 2024 cycle. And his long recruitment has an end in sight. Black set a commitment date of November 29th. So just about a week from now, the number three ranked corner, the number 38 player overall, top 50 players. So we're talking elite of the elite. He's going to make his decision. And I'm bringing on Texas insider Jerry Hamilton to break down who the, who the competition is for the top uncommitted corner in America. But first, subscribe to the On3 Recruits channel. Look, we're getting this thing up to 25K. We need you to be a part of it. So hit subscribe for me, please. Okay, let's bring on expert Jerry Hamilton from Inside Texas. Jerry, you've been all over this recruitment the entire cycle. Now, Kobe Plack set to decide November 29. Who are the main teams involved? What hats are expected to be on the table when he announces? That's a great question, Josh, because A&M doesn't have a coach right now, right? Yeah. So, I mean, is there, is there going to be an A&M hat on the table? Oklahoma State will probably be a hat on the table. Where his brother plays, he's been up there more than anywhere else this season due to going up there with his family to watch Corey Black play. But, look, Texas has been the main uh, leader the whole time in this recruitment. And who knows, Josh, maybe it's recruitment there are no hats on the table. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Uh, what makes him such a great player? Number three ranked corner in the country, but what are some of the characteristics of his game? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things with with uh, Kobe is he he's a multi-sport athlete. He's, he's got a great sports mind. I know that sounds weird to say, but he understands sports. I mean, he can play quarterback, he can play receiver. He can play corner. He can play safety. He's kind of – he can do whatever they ask him to do and perform that well as a corner prospect i'll tell you one of, one of the areas he's probably undervalued because he he doesn't get tested in the high school level the small school level as much he is really patient at the line of scrimmage patient in coverage and he's got really good feel for when to get his head around and make a play on a football and he does so at 6'2", 200 pounds. He's closing on 200 pounds, Josh. So uh, he, I think he's a boundary corner. I think he's a really good player because he's physical. He's got ball skills that show up on the basketball court. They show up when he's playing a receiver uh, more so because he's not challenged that much at the high school level as a cornerback. But it's that patience and that's understanding and that feel for the position that I think puts him ahead of a lot of other guys, especially being an early enrollee. Oh, and it doesn't help that his brother's a corner at Oklahoma State either. So, look, when they break down tape, they're really breaking down tape. Yeah, he's developed into a really elite prospect. Um, let's take a look at the recruiting prediction machine. It shows Texas the overwhelming favorite at 95%. So, up to this point, what have the Horns done to kind of position themselves as the favorite heading into this decision? Yeah, I think it's it's an interesting recruitment because, look, his his father played at Kansas State. Obviously, Corey plays at Oklahoma State. 
this is a family who's been through multiple recruitments as whether it's as a power five athlete, whether it's his father, whether it's with Corey. So nothing is new for this family, right? So they know the genuineness of relationships that you can't fool them in this recruiting process. I think Terry Joseph's done a great job uh, in terms of that. And Steve Sarkeesian obviously has been personally involved in this recruitment from the Texas side. Uh, so look, I think there's that the really good bond, the really good relationships. And look, when Colin Simmons committed to Texas too, Corey and Colin have gotten close. I think that's helped the Texas side of this. Um, and then I think the other thing, you know, helping Texas in this recruitment uh, is look, Ryan Watts is a starting boundary corner off uh, to professional football. Um, so there's an opportunity there if he picks Texas as an early enrollee. I mean, a, a guy that can come in. In December, and the, I'll say the other thing too, with in regard to Texas, is Jelani McDonald, freshman uh, defensive back, mm -hmm. and Trey Wise, their freshman running back. Even though he finished his career at DeSoto, they both they all grew up playing together. So when when Kobe has questions about Texas, he's got two guys he can go to for answers. So the players, Josh, you know how important it is for players to recruit future players. And I think in this case, Texas has a lot of things going for him, and we'll see what happens here on November 29th. Yeah, uh, next Wednesday he'll make his decision. So if you were talking to Texas fans right now and you said, hey, you between now and then, Texas is in a good spot, but I would watch for what team or teams between now and Wednesday. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I just, Josh, I'm not sure who that is. I mean, look, it, it was LSU for a while, didn't make the official visit. A&M tried to get him on an official visit. He never made the official visit. The only team out there really is Oklahoma State right now. He never made return trips to Oregon, Ohio yeah. State, and anywhere else. So, I mean, right now, who's Texas competition? That's been the question we've been asking the entire time. And the only one that's there left standing right now is Oklahoma State. All right. Well, the number three cornerback in the country is going to come off the board in about a week. Right now, it's kind of eerily quiet right now, but we'll see what happens in the next couple uh, days as we count down to Kobe Black's commitment. Jerry Hamilton from Inside Texas. Thanks for dropping by the Inside Scoop. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed that content, be sure to subscribe to the On3 Recruits channel. We have a new page dedicated only to recruiting. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button right now.